This episode of The Luminaries on Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Deputy, rostering and timesheets without the usual chaos. I am proudest when I see that somebody has really enjoyed and themselves and he's going to remember that for a long time and when somebody says oh where's a place that you've been to that's you know etched in your mind or that you've had a good time in if they mention Florentino or one of my venues well that's what makes me proud and that's what I enjoy. This is the Luminaries on the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Small family owned and operated cafes and restaurants are the heart and soul of the hospitality sector. Most family-run venues are hubs of the community that connect and sustain everyone in small communities. But there are some families who over generations have helped shape the Australian culinary landscape over the last few decades too. Guy Grossi is one of Australia's best chefs and restaurateurs and owner of Grossi Restaurants. Guy, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's great to have you on. Your family has had the most extraordinary influence on Australia's culinary history. What's it like being part of a family that over generations has given so much? Look, um, we're a very humble family, so I like to think that... um, Melbourne has given us a great platform to, you know, do what we do every day that we and what we really love to do every day. So we we're embracing of of that, all embracing of that. Um, and but it, well, the one uh, word that really sums it up would be pride. We're very very proud to be um, continuing not only um, a hospitality business but also um, continuing the Italian legacy that my parents brought with them when they came out here to Australia in 1960. Yeah, tell us about that because you, you grew up with a father who was a chef. Um, what was it like being a young kid in an Italian family in Australia with a, a father who was a chef? Well, Anthony, we, we were very lucky, myself and my siblings. We grew up in a very loving household. It was a migrant family. Um, my mother cooked for us virtually every day. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I, we probably never saw the inside of a, a restaurant, even though, my, unless we're in the kitchen helping dad, um, until we were about, until I was about 15. It was the first time dad probably took us out to dine out other than family and friends' hi- houses. Um, and um, that was just our lifestyle. Um, and, you know, mum cooked some delicious food. Um, the kitchen was always the hub of the home. So, you know, we were always hanging around in there. We, we went to see mum in there. We went to see dad in there when he was home. Um, we ate in that room. So it was the room of the house that got used at the absolute most. And from that, you develop a real, you know, sense of, of love for food. You know, dad was an avid gardener as well as being a, a great chef um, and worked very hard um, at work. Um, but he always made it a point to, you know, through the day, come home, pick us up from school um, and um, take us home. We'd have a meal together and then he'd be off to work again. Um, so you develop this real great appreciation for good produce grown in the in the family garden and then um you know mum lovingly cooking it your parents came to australia from milan um, can you give us a, a sense of some of the dishes that you remember from your youth in, in your family Absolutely. Well, Dad was actually originally from Puglia. He was from a small town um, called Carosino in in the south of Italy, uh, Puglia. Um, so we had the and Mum was from the Veneto, from Verona. Um, so we had this lovely mix of of different cucina italiana, and they also worked together in Milan for fifteen years. So of course, Cotoletta la Milanese was a was a, a feature, um, as was um, also Bucco la Milanese, beautiful braised. Viochins, um, and um, also the lovely and rustic food from the south of Italy, like orecchietti with broccoli, um, and then the beautiful, you know, things like gnocchi with gorgonzola from the north, and lots of polenta. Polenta is a really good filler when you're growing up in the Melbourne suburbs, especially in the winter time. <laughs> You mentioned you were about 15 when you sort of first went to a restaurant uh, properly. What, what, what lured you? to a career as a chef when you were young? Was, was it the inspiration through the family or were there other things happening? 
Um, there, look, I, Dad used to drag me along on school holidays and weekends to work in, with him where he was working. Um, and, you know, I kind of felt to myself, this is really hard. Who would want to work like this? Um, and so I thought, you know, I, I, I really don't want to do that. But then when I, when I was um, 15, 16, I did, it just, you know, you sort of get – accustomed to the to the people the energy and um i just really wanted to start an apprenticeship so i went out and started an apprenticeship and um and then i found um the joy in working with people that were really interested in creating an experience for someone um to, or a platform for people to create a memory, you know, and, and just working with produce and really caring about something so much. So it gets under your skin and um, you just sort of, I think, take it from there and you just you just develop in that way. And I think it's the actual people you're working with as well, like-minded people, you know, and um, working for a common cause, a common goal. I think that's really important. That's what gives you the real energy. Early on in your career, you worked at a really important restaurant in Melbourne's history, Two Faces. Do you, do you have any stories of the experiences that you had there? Uh, well, the experiences we had there, I, I think I speak for most of the people that came through there, um, were hard, but we loved it. Um, we, Mr. Schneider, gave us a level of discipline that we never really experienced before. Um, and um, the produce was um, next to none. Um, the, the, you know, the farmers were important to him. Um, they'd come to see him. Um, and um, it was a level that I hadn't really seen before. And, and um, we we're all very proud to be able to work under him because um, of his nature and the way he was. He was quite a hard taskmaster, but he had such good knowledge and, and great skill and um, he really you know put his money where his mouth is when it came to sourcing the best ingredients and everything so we I, I felt that um, it was a great learning um, place for myself and for many other young chefs you've uh, worked obviously with the Grossi family for um, many decades and in, in many different restaurants as well um, in those early days what, what was it like working with family and um, creating these restaurant experiences uh, look it's, it's always been a joy for me I mean I like I, as I said my father worked very very hard when I was a young person um so we didn't get to see a great deal of him we saw mum a lot more um we saw him each day for a very short amount of time um when i first uh started to work with him as a young professional um then and i was learning from him um then we got to spend um days together and um for the first time as a young adult i was spending more time with my father than i had when i was a young a young child um and i and i really enjoyed that experience um, don't get me wrong. We had our, our fair share of Barney's as well, um, as you do as as we do in the whole family. But it's it's not all better roses. But um, but it's always you know that you're going to make up, and you know that there's a great camaraderie there. And um, and I lo learn a lot from my father, which was which I'm very proud of. Um, the biggest thing being um, work ethic. You know, um, he was a very disciplined man, and he worked very very hard. And he was of the firm belief that the hardy you work the luckier you get and you know if you you were very proud of being here in melbourne and he you know he said this is a great land a great place of opportunity you just have to make sure you work hard enough then you're disciplined enough to be able to make the most of it so that was great and then as i got older you know um uh, we got into our own businesses and um and uh, other siblings came on board, um, um, worked with my sister Liz um, and also for a short time my brother as he was working his way through medical school um, and um, we, we all got along. Take us back to the time when you opened uh, Quadri in, in Armadale. What was it like um, creating a restaurant in that time and, and building it from scratch? Um, it, was, it was pretty frightening but I sort of thought, look, you know, uh, I'm a young person. I, I started very young um, and I was with my 
um, wife to be. We started that together, um, and um, you know there was elements of of you know we we were sort of work, working our way through, learning as we went, um, and um, but it was exciting. It was really exciting, and um, it was a small restaurant. It was a a fifty seater restaurant. Um, it was BYO only, so that made it a little bit simpler. Um, and it was a lovely suburban restaurant, but um, you know there was that level of excitement about being able to start something new um, and being able to do your own thing. Um, and I found it fascinating and it was a great learning curve. It really was. Um, and the people that came along really appreciated it. And they were, because it was such a local restaurant, they um, supported us really well, which was fantastic. Um, I remember we got a, a review on a Sunday radio show saying that um, it was nice to go to. And we went from doing, you know, like 20 covers a night to doing 50 covers a night and we were running like we went crazy um, and um, you know phones just started ringing so we had to we had to land on our feet pretty quickly to keep up with it and make sure it all went well but we really enjoyed that and I think it put us or it put me in good stead for future business because as I say we started so long, young so it gave us a real a real learning ground um, and you know, sort of made me realize early that there was a lot I still had to learn, which was fantastic because then I went out and sought the knowledge. What did you, what did you take from that time? There was um, obviously the challenges and a lot of lessons learned, but um, what, what were the big surprises for you in running a business that you kind of weren't aware of until you, you jumped in? Well, I think um, I, we didn't have the business acronym that we probably should have learnt about a lot more before we jumped in. Um, and so we were learning on the go. But thank thankfully, we surrounded ourselves by a team of great people, you know, an excellent accountant, um, that sort of thing that really helped us. Um, I found We found that we were trying to do too much um, and we found that once we started simplifying things a little bit, we, um, we started to, you know, get – uh, a lot more traction um, so that that taught us a lot as well um, and we found that um, you know I started to learn very young that hospitality really prevails and and I think that you know as a chef I learned quite early on and I think that experience taught me that you know it's not just about great food and even great service but it's also about creating that really hospitable experience and treating people like they're coming into your own home that gives gives them that feeling that they want to come back to you and i think that was really important melbourne's uh, restaurant and cafe scene you know arguably second to none in the world um particularly the cafe scene what, what was it like for you opening a uh, cafe grossi with with your father and the influence that it had a, a, at the time um it was a fantastic experience um again we hit the ground running there as well it got very busy very quickly we were lucky um but um i think just um being able to um, create something that um, people gravitated to was a really beautiful experience for the family, um, and it and it taught us a lot about you know, Melburnians that you know very you know sort of loyal creatures like they will go and try new places and all of that sort of thing, but they'll always come back to you because they respect and like what you're doing, and and I think that's that's one of the great things about the dining public in Melbourne is that they do find their their little places that they really enjoy and they support them they come back and support them um but that wasn't you know again you know we had our hardships there as well i mean we were going amazingly well until you know about 1989 just at the end of 89 and you know um the recession came on so we experienced um a real um downturn in business for quite some time um and um we just had to pull our belts in and uh we we're the sort of family we just um, said, look, you know, as long as we can pay our people and, you know, pay our suppliers, we're just going to carry on and get through this. Um, and that's what we did. You know, we, we negotiated with our landlord at the time and they were helpful. Um, and, you know, the sort of staring down the barrel of whether you have no tenant or a tenant paying le a little bit less rent. And they went for the latter, which was, which was good of them. So they helped us through in that, in that manner. Um, and, um, and, and we got through and then, 
the good times came again and because we'd been there um, then you know the our clientele really rewarded us and came back to us which was fantastic well those good times led to um, a move by you to uh, rejuvenate a, a classic uh, really important historical restaurant in Melbourne the Florentino um, Take us through the decision and what it was like to take on such an iconic place and, and breathe new life into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'd always loved the place um, and only because, you know, growing up as a as a kid, you know, I'd listen to my dad's stories. And back then, chefs weren't, you know, sort of necessarily iconic names in people's homes, but they were well known around the industry. That's how you became a, a well-known chef. You were known by other chefs, by maitre d's and the, and people that owned restaurants. Um, and, um, you know, the stories were always wonderful and, you know, aspirational stories of people doing great things. And the Florentino was never far away in those conversations because of the fact that Dad really, you know, had a, a, a great love for it in the sense that it was part of the group. When he came to work here in Melbourne in 1960, he was brought out by Mario Vigano, who had a hotel around the corner from Florentino's called... Um, called uh, Mario's. Uh, it was a very well-known restaurant at the time. Um, he also had Farm Vigano, um, where he grew a lot of the produce for the restaurant. Um, and one of the first places that, you know, the lads brought Dad for a um, for a bit of uh, vino, you know, at, in the downtime was um, – was Florentino and in the cellar bar. And so it had a real iconic kind of memory for him and he used to describe it with such um, love that it became part of the, where we went to visit, you know, when we were in the city um, and it, it was something that was always there in the background. So when I heard um, uh, on the grapevine that um, the then owner, uh, Lorraine Podgenick, um, had an idea about, you know, moving on and selling the restaurant, I approached her and I said, "Look, you know, we'd be really interested in looking at um, at something at some doing something here. If it's true that you're in fact selling, if it's not true, then I'll just be on my way. Basically, I didn't want to be rude. I, I knew Lorraine. I didn't want to offend her. Um, uh, but she said, "Look, guy, I, I have been thinking about it. Um, so, you know, when I'm ready, I'll give you a call." Um, and she was true to her word. A few months later, she her, her son gave us a call. We negotiated. Took took a couple of months, and we put together a deal and. And that was that. And we've never looked back. I mean, we love it. Um, it's iconic. And um, we f we feel like it's ours now. And that took a few years because the, the we're just custodians of a wonderful old place. But, you know, for quite some time, you know, the guests and customers that came here to our place um, felt more like the owners than we did um, because they'd been coming for so long. Um, so, you know, we had to tread with, with trepidation, but there were certain things that were non-negotiable and we had to change. And as you say, we had to freshen the place up and give her a new life. And um, she's had a lot of, um, you know, makeovers since. Um, we've been here uh, 20, 24 years or so now. And um, we've, um, you know, every, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. It never stops. Like it's like having a home. You know, you never stop fixing, changing, uh, adjusting. You know, and and that's one of the beauties of um, Grossi Florentino is that it has a real life of its own. And um, and you know, we don't mind putting back into it because um, we feel that uh, an iconic place like that just deserves it, and um, our guests deserve it. And so. I think to keep it looking and feeling fresh, it's not only for our guests, which are, they're the premium, the primal thing. You know, you've got to keep people happy and, and entertained and coming back. But it's also something for the family, you know, because it in, it's inspiring to keep things fresh and moving. Um, but it's for the team as well because they get a real buzz out of out of things happening, new things happening, and um, and I think that keeps the energy. Um, and with energy um, comes, you know, the people, the desire for people to be there and be doing good things. This episode of The Luminaries on Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Deputy, helping managers and staff do their best work. Building a business is hard. I feel it as I build my business. But I can tell you one thing, that every single day, I feel very blessed for the impact our business deputy has in this hospitality community and the numerous stories that we have been part of. Stories where I've heard 
deputy customers who have opened new restaurants because of the cost savings they have had by implementing deputy in their business. Being able to open new restaurant, creating new employment, new opportunities, and new connections. For more information, go to deputy.com. Even though you have quite a few venues and it's it's such a big group, you, there's so many family members involved with with Grossi restaurants. So just tell us a little bit about the family that are involved and the different roles and, and how you work together. Well, Carlo, um, my son, he's um, on the floor mainly, but we also work together and collaborate with uh, my brother-in-law on menus and, and things of that nature also. Um, he wor- he works in the upstairs dining room on a day-to-day basis, but, you know, has his hand over many of the venues as well as far as, you know, operations. Um, I'm on operations um, and I still get into the kitchen as much as I can, which I really enjoy. That's a part of my work that I really enjoy the most to be honest but I I enjoy the creative side of things as well creating menus and um, you know working um, on research and you know developing new relationships with new producers and things of that nature which I find very inspiring to go towards menu development and, and things of that like that. Um, uh, then there's my sister who's um, more in the a- administration side, although during during um, November, December, she was on the floor as well, beating the pavement as – yeah, so she, so it was all hands on deck. Well, we, lo- we we lost a lot of people in recent times for obvious reasons. So it was all hands on deck, and every everyone was working so hard. You know, the the, the team that was that we were left with our core team and all family members. But yeah, Liz does um, uh, more of the administrative type work and the um, sort of management type work. Um, and then there's um, my wife Melissa, who is very heavily involved in you know, what we do day to day when it comes to decision making um, and forward planning. And she works in the financial area of the business. Um, Loredana works on the floor when she has to, um, but she's also very heavily involved in the marketing side of things for our business um, when it comes down to, you know, website designs and um, and all those sorts of things, menu designs. Uh, yeah. Basically, she's our fashion Nazi. So you know, we go to we go put through the, put it the filter. She's our filter when we're making a decision when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, and my brother-in-law, as I said, is a chef that we've been working together since the days of Cafe Grossi. So um, we work side by side, and uh, with that, um, a really good strong team around. Uh, as I said before, um, culturally div- culturally diverse. Um, you know, a lot of age diversity in the team as well. People that have been with us for 20, 30 years, and people that have been with us for three years. So, uh, and and you know, three in some cases three months. And I think that's what. Um, Keeps it really dynamic and really interesting, and it's a uh, and it's uh, I got to say I'm uh, I feel very lucky and blessed. I, I do have I know a lot of people say it, but I do have a very devoted team of people, and you know, especially when it comes to you know chefs and people working on the floor at the front line and all of that. Um, the, the people in our team really want to do it, and and I think that's a really refreshing thing especially now that the industry needs to rebuild um it's so refreshing to see young people come into it um i was at a at box hill tafe um recently doing a, a talk for some new new newbies that had just started as apprentices and trainees and um to see a room full of you know youthful people that want to be in the industry and that's and they de- want to devote their lives to it um, is inspiring and it's really refreshing to someone like myself um, who's been in it for over forty years. Well, that sense of family and also the connection with your guests is really typified by Christmas Day at Grossi Florentino. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of that and 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 what it means to the family and the restaurant and also the customers of Grossi Florentino? Absolutely. Um, Christmas Day is one of those things that's now developed into a tradition, I guess, that that happens here. Um, We've always kind of been – we've always worked as a family on Christmas Day because, you know, Christmas Day is a day that people like to celebrate. Um, So we're generally – in our restaurants, we've always been open. Um, And when we came to Florentino, it was no different. We open Christmas Day lunch. Um, We do it in the grill and we do it upstairs in in our restaurant. 
at Florentino, um, and it really is not like no other service during the year. It's it's um, completely different. You know, we run a very lengthy menu. Um, it's it's a festive menu, and um, you know the streamers on the tables. There's the bonbons, and there's guests that have been coming for as long as we've been open, um, and um, some some might. Yeah, they, they they all know each other now, which is amazing. They just rebook their table next year. Sometimes they might miss a year, but then rebook again because they've been travelling or something like that. But it actually becomes like um, a big family having a Christmas gathering or Christmas feast, and then by about half time, you've got everybody throwing streamers and getting up and chatting to everybody else. So it's it's a really it's a really wonderful day to work. Uh, we all love it, um, and you know um, you just everyone has a great time, including the team. Um, and it's just for the ones that do it for the first time that are working on the crew, they just their eyes are popping out of their head they just can't believe what's going on um but it's so much fun and then um we do a quick tidy up not a big tidy up because we want to get out and um you know get back to our families so we we get home and have christmas night at home and then usually get back in the next day and tidy up properly um but it's uh it's a it's a real fun event and really really festive we love it your restaurants have won an incredible amount of accolades and, you know, really at the, the pointy end in regards to quality and, and service and expectation. But there's also that sense of it being a family business and a family loving offering. How do you strike that balance over so many venues and, and maintain that consistency? Well, I'm lucky in the sense that um, a, a lot of our, a few of our venues are in the same block, you know, which makes it easy for to run around and and um, you know keep having that DNA um, refreshed. But um, you know, even with um, you know, say our our um, our partnership in Perth with uh, Garum over there with the Western, um, it's just keeping in touch with the people that are there and having good a good group of people around you. And I think that holds true for whether I'm standing right next to people working on a shift or whether, you know, I'm somewhere else. Um, as long as you're keeping in touch continuously and the family's keeping in touch, which is something that we really pride ourselves on to talk to people continuously and make sure that, you know, um, we have a vision for our business. We need to put that into into very clear language so that the team understands that vision and the DNA stays alive. You know, we have, um, we have our mission statements, but more, more than importantly than that, our, our, our brand values. And, um, we, when we started as a smaller business, um, we just kind of knew what we wanted and we knew what we were doing and it was a very small team. So it kind of, didn't need to be articulated as well but that's one thing we learned that as we were growing and um, we were getting a few more venues on board we really needed to articulate these um, these uh, company values or our business values um, and that they are really important that everybody on board understands what those are and um, and just lives their life within the business um, Ticking off those those values and making sure that when they're when they're around the business and when they're and and hopefully in everyday life as well, they behave they behave according to those values. And I think if you can get if you can get that ninety percent right, then you you've started really well and you'll create a culture within the business that that is um you know that is fruitful and works and is is um great for team building and all of those things that go together to form an excellent business with great customer service in mind. It's an understatement to say the last two years have been challenging for the industry, but um, what's the current situation for you at the moment? Um, are there positives to come from um, what has happened and have, and have you changed a lot in this time with the operations of the restaurant? Well, we ha I think the positives are that we're back and we're doing the thing that we love. I think uh, people, whether it be on my side of the fence or the other side, meaning guests, have really learned a new a new sense of appreciation for what we do, um, ourselves included, um, to serve those first customers coming out of lockdown. Um, uh, I. Got to tell you, it was very emotional. Um, 
almost tear wrenching emotional um, to to know that you could actually start doing what you do what you love so much again. And our guests, I believe, are so appreciative and they want to enjoy themselves. There's a pent up desire to have a good time, um, and they're doing that. And they're respectful and they're appreciative. And I think that we've been able to reset as well in our industry and revalue what we do. And I think that's a positive. Just put the right value on what we do because I think it's really important moving into the next phase so that we can pay everybody properly, so that we can buy the produce from people that are looking after their creatures or their or their or their teams and all sorts of and all those kinds of things. And we can tick all those boxes and make sure it's a real story and not just, you know, some sort of window dressing. And that all comes at a cost. So I think to be able to say, okay, well we need to make sure that we get all that right. So the cost needs to be passed on because and there's good reason for it and there's a newfound appreciation for it. So I think that's a that's a very um, important element to what has happened, that reset button. The other things is, um, you know, I mean, as an offside thing, our Grossi Casa came out of it, a brand which we developed through necessity, but it's quite a good thing now. We love it and we're going to keep it, even though it's not it's not anywhere near as as you know, busy as when obviously the restaurants were closed, but it's still doing its thing and, and it's something that we feel we can develop and it's something in the future we, we think could be a very valuable aspect to our business. And so the other thing that we found is, you know, different efficiencies in our business. You know, we've had to, we've had to come back with, you know, um, teams that were – underpowered to what we used to have. So, you know, we've got some some restrictions still on, but really we're restricting ourselves with the amount of guests that we might do on any particular session because we've had shortages in, in the team. Um, and we're finding that there is a sweet spot there, you know, um, maybe, maybe not going back to the big numbers that we used to do um, and finding that balance between, you know, um, guests being really happy and also the team not being under that intense pressure, making a better work environment for for the team and for the, you know, all the people working around them. Um, and um, just little efficiencies, you know, from a technical point of view, you know, we've had to, you know, for example, work out of one kitchen downstairs instead of two. Maybe the model um, is changed there as a little example of, of how we do things. Um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, Ombra will open you know, very soon um, and we'll come back with maybe a few less shifts um, in order to be able to manage that. Um, so little efficiencies that we've found, um, you know, through necessity um, has been a, quite a good learning curve. You learnt the ropes from your dad and then there came a time where you were teaching the ropes to your son, Carlo. What's, what, what's that been like, um, transferring your knowledge and then seeing his career um, flourish? It's been fantastic, actually, something I'm very proud of and very proud that we can work so well together. Um, we're a good team. I think, as I've mentioned earlier, he brings youth to the to the table um, and brings new ideas, fresh ideas. Um, I can sort of guide him and, you know, give him the benefit of my knowledge and the benefit of my mistakes. Um, he can go off and make those same mistakes if he wants to, but at least he's got a head start, you know, and, um, and I think that's, and I think that's pretty good. But the best t thing is that we have a fantastic relationship. Um, I would s describe Carlo as, as more of a, a, a real mate as well as being my son. And we love to just go out together and have a lunch or something. And, or just go out and have a glass of wine together and catch up and, you know, talk about business. We're always just talking about the restaurant anyway, so that's the main thing we, we consume in our conversation. Um, but, uh, but you know, it's, um, it's just a real pleasure to be able to work side by side and, um, and have that great collaboration. And um, I learn heaps from him as well as what, I can teach him because um, he has, you know, his own experiences and everything to bring to the table. And, and I, I see that in, as I think I mentioned it before, I see that in a lot of my young chefs as well and front of house people as well. I've got to mention them because they're so important in our business. Um, 
and these days ever ever more than they have been. Um, and I, I think that um, that you know these people coming into your business, they have experiences from all around the place. So you know, I just love learning new things, and and I love and I, I'm not one to sort of you know say no, this is the way we've always done it. Like if you come along and say I've got a better way of doing this, I'd be silly if I was paying you you know a salary and not listening to you. That'd be stupid. It'd be like paying you your lawyer and not listening to them for their advice, you know? So if somebody can bring, you know, new knowledge and new experience and better ways of doing things into the business and Hey, that's how you grow, right? 40 years is, is extraordinary. The influence that you and your family have had, um, on the culinary landscape. What is it that like, you love about what you do? Uh, I mentioned that before. I think it's creating memories, having people create memories in my venues. You know, like you come along for the food and service. That's the catch. But when you're in um, a venue, you have a special time, whether it be, you know, a casual experience or whether it be um, at Florentino in the upstairs dining room and it's a lengthy kind of tasting menu that you're enjoying. But I, I am proudest when I see that somebody has really enjoyed and themselves and he's going to remember that for a long time and when somebody says oh where's a place that you've been to that's you know um you know etched in your mind or that you've had a good time in um they'll if they mention florentino or one of my venues well that's what makes me proud and that's what i enjoy well, I know so many people have absolutely loved the experiences that you and your family have given over the years, and it's an absolute honour to have you on the Luminaries on Deep in the Weeds today to hear just a little bit of your story. Um, Guy, please keep in touch, and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.